بر محمد و آل محمد سلوات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الفاتحة صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أولئك الذين هدى الله فبهداه مقتدي قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إن هو إلا ذكرى للعالمين. So in your gathering with remembrance upon Muhammad and Al Muhammad. As a gift to the soul of our beloved Maulana. Abdullah al Hussein recite the second salawat. <laughs> to hasten the reappearance of Sayyidina wa Mawlana Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, recite the third salawat with the loudest of your voices. <laughs> The adherers to the Abrahamic faiths with more than 4 billion followers make the majority of the citizens of this earth. And the Abrahamic faiths all have three main principles in common. The first principle that all the Abrahamic faiths have in common and share is the principle of the monotheistic ornament, Tawheed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a reference to this notion within the Holy Qur'an. Where he tells the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam to engage in an open dialogue 
to engage in an open dialogue with the Christians and the Jews. قُلْ يَا أَحْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَلَّا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَا نُشْرِكْ بِهِ شَيْئًا O oh, you Prophet, tell the people of the book, the Christians and the Jews, who are also part of the Abrahamic faith, let us come together to worship the one and only Allah, and let us not take partners with the Almighty God. Therefore, the very first principle that the Abrahamic faiths have in common is the principle of Tawheed, the monotheistic ornament. The second principle that the Abrahamic faiths have in common is the principle of prophethood or nubuwa. Individuals such as Abraham, Noah, Moses, Isaac, David, Solomon, Jesus, are known to be prophets according to the Abrahamic faiths. And the third principle that the Abrahamic faiths have in common is the principle of divine laws. Meaning all the Abrahamic faiths share the ideology that God has sent and has set specific laws that are meant to govern the people. Those laws are of two categories. The first category are laws that can never be updated, can never be changed, or can never be abrogated. What type of laws? For example, the prohibition of murder is one of those laws. The prohibition of rape. The prohibition of theft. The prohibition of lying. The prohibition of backbiting. Those are all laws that since the beginning of time, and since God appointed the prophet Adam, until the last messenger, Al-Khatam, they never changed. And that is why scholars believe that those are the major sins. Scholars believe that those are the major sins or what's known as dhunub al-kaba'ir. Why? Because you really don't need a prophet to come and tell you that murder is forbidden. It is part of the human nature. You really don't need a prophet to come and tell you that lying is forbidden. It's part of the human nature. You really don't need a prophet to come and tell you backbiting is forbidden because it's part of the human nature. That is why they are recognized to be the cardinal sins. الذنوب الكبائر However, on the other hand, there are laws that can be changed, updated, and abrogated. What are those laws? Laws such as, for example, the concept of fasting. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuha al-ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum al-siyamu kama kutiba ala al-ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O oh, you people, fasting has been prescribed unto you similarly as it was prescribed unto the nations before you. Fasting was prescribed upon the Jews. Fasting was prescribed upon the Christians. Fasting was prescribed upon the people of Nuh, the people of Ibrahim. However, in a different form. The Prophet Muhammad came and updated the laws in regards to siyam or fasting. Likewise, the laws in regards to marriage are laws that have been updated. 
We know previous to Islam, a man can have as many wives as he wants. But Islam came and limited the number to four with the restriction of adala, justice. To apply justice amongst all wives. Similarly, another law that has been updated is the law of inheritance. And religions prior to Islam, a woman would not inherit. But Islam came and allocated an inheritance for the female gender. Now with that said, we have an extremely important principle and the Islamic ju jurisprudence. What is this principle that I'm about to introduce? This principle is known as the concept of istishab. The presumption of continuity. What is the presumption of continuity? The presumption of continuity states that if I am at a state of certainty, if I'm at a state of certainty, Nothing can revoke the state of certainty unless with another certainty. Therefore, doubt can never come and remove certainty. What do I mean? I mean, for example, at 10 a.m., you have wudu. 12 p.m., you want to pray dhuhr and asr. 1 p.m., you want to pray dhuhr and asr. You have certainty that you did wudu at 10. Now it's 12. Now it's 1. Do I still have wudu? I have shek. I had yaqeen that I did wudu. Now I have shek. Do I still have my wudu or do I not? What do I do? I presume the continuity of my wudu. Therefore, I never remove my certainty with doubt. Another example. We have an imam that prays the Jum'ah prayers. He is adil. Therefore, we pray behind him. He's just, therefore, we pray behind him. Because the Imam of the Jama'ah, the prayers, has to be Adil. So we are certain of his Adala. Then, one week after the Friday prayers, he says, Brothers, sisters, inshallah, this week I will go on a vacation to Vegas. And inshallah, we'll come next week. So next week, you come through the door and you see Mawlana is looking very handsome, he's looking very comfortable. So you say, is he still Adil? I have doubt. What did he do in Vegas? You had certainty that he, ha he was? He was what? Adil. Now you have shek. Is he still Adil or not? What do you do? You presume the continuity of his Adala. You presume the continuity of his justice, the state of Adala. Therefore you pray behind him. This notion of the presumption of continuity or istishab is number one, derived through, derived through reason, intellect. Someone tells you, hey, I'll meet you up at my house tonight at 8. You don't say, well, did this guy change his house since last week? No. You automatically presume the continuity of the fact that his house is there, I'm just going to drive there. If it were to change, I'd know. Also, Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi and a very famous and a very famous tradition states to one of his companions don't ever abrogate your state of certainty with shek or with doubt. Now with that said, we have a very famous scholar by the name of Al-Akhund al-Khurasani who, who has come forward and stated we are certain that a person by the name of Jesus was there and he had a set of laws. We are certain that a person by the name of Noah was there with a set of laws. We are certain that a person by the name of Jesus, Moses was there with a set of laws. Therefore, those laws are still applicable until we know that those laws have been updated, changed, or abrogated. And it's a principle by using logic. He also refers to the verse that I began my lecture with. An extremely controversial verse. What does the verse say? 
Surah Al-Ma'adah, chapter 6, verse 90. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ هَدَ اللَّهِ فَبِهُدَاهُ مُقْتَدِ They are the ones that Allah has guided, therefore seek their guidance. The ayah referring to previous prophets. Basically, the verse states to the Prophet Muhammad, Ya Rasul Allah, Noah, Jesus, Moses, Abraham were the guided ones, therefore follow their footsteps, follow their guidelines. This is the first tafsir of the first portion of the ayah that I spoke of. Chapter 6, verse 90. The second tafsir of this portion of the verse has stated no. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is khatamul anbiya. He is khatamul anbiya. Therefore his religion is the most complete religion. And if he has the most complete laws, it is irrelevant for the complete to follow what was incomplete prior to him. Therefore, the verse is really not speaking of legal issues, but the verse is indeed referring to metaphysical and spiritual aspects. What do I mean? Meaning, Ya Rasulullah, you're going through hardship today. Prophets prior to you also went through hardship. Allah, before this verse, before the verse 90 of chapter 6, mentioned 18 prophets in Surah Al-An'am. Nuh, Adam, Ayyub, Salih, Lut, 18 prophets. As soon as he finished the mention of 18 prophets, he said, Ya Rasul Allah, they are the guided ones, Seek an example in their guidance. Meaning, Ya Rasulullah, when you are impatient, when you face difficulty, remember the patience of Ayyub. You all know the story of Ayyub, a prophet that had 11 sons, and they all died. He had wealth, he lost his wealth. He had health, he lost his health. He lost everything. To a point that traditions say his wife had to sell her hair in order to bring a loaf of bread to feed the Prophet, Ayyub. And all this time, Ayyub kept saying, Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> so Ya Rasulullah, when you experience such difficulty, consolidate yourself with the example of Ayyub. Ya Rasulullah, when people mock you, and they call you a liar, and they call you a magician, Consolidate yourself and seek comfort in the remembrance of Nuh. How so? Nuh was building an ark. Where? It was in no shape or form in close proximity of an ocean. It was far away from an ocean. So imagine what he had to go through. Nuh, you're building this ark for what? How are you going to take it to the water? Making fun of him every single day. Accusing him of insanity every single day. Ya Rasulullah, you shall go through the same thing. Seek comfort in, this, in the example of Nuh. That's the second tafsir. The third tafsir is the tafsir of those who attribute themselves to the school of Sunnah. The school of the companions. Take a look at the tafsir of 690 of Al-Imam Al-Qurtubi. The number one mufassir of this particular school, the school of the Sahaba. <clears throat> he states that Rasulullah was inflicted by magic for 40 days. So every time he went to salah to perform the prayers and he wanted to recite Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, he would instead of saying Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, he would say Qul Allat and Uzza. He would mention the name of the idols of the Kaaba, he couldn't, he couldn't, Rasulullah couldn't really help it. Every time he wanted to say, Qul Allahu Ahad, the magicians had taken over him, so he would say, Qul Allah Tu Al-Uzza. Not just that, he also further states that Rasulullah, through magic, was so confused to the point where he didn't know if he was a prophet or not. He was constantly doubting, am I a prophet? Am I not a prophet? 
What's going on? Am I going to be able to deliver this message? Am I not going to deliver this message? So Allah told him, Muhammad, relax. Those, the prophets that I just mentioned, they all went through the same thing. So you seek in their example, remain steadfast, remain strong. <clears throat> the reason why I started with the three principles of the Abrahamic faiths is to tell you how dangerous this ideology is. Goes directly against a common principle shared by all the Abrahamic faiths. The principle of prophethood. Now imagine we believe in the fact that there is a prophet, but this prophet, instead of praying in normal prayers, he speaks of the name of the idols of Quraysh. And one day he comes to you and he tells you that I'm a prophet. The next day he says, wait a minute, I have doubt. Am I a prophet or not? And this is in the tafsir of the Qur'an. <clears throat> but then what surprises me is that they become upset when the Prophet is portrayed in such a manner in a movie. Go look at your own books. Go look at how you are portraying the Prophet Muhammad. Then come out and stand and say, well, this movie was disrespectful. For 1,400 years, unfortunately, the Prophet has been disrespected. And I'm going to talk about this in an entire lecture. The fourth tafsir of the first portion of this ayah states that when Allah states, Ya Rasul Allah, seek comfort in the story of Ibrahim and Nuh and Salih and Isa and Musa, he's actually speaking to the Muslims from then and that point in time and until today that seek comfort in the story of, for example, Maryam. Allah sent down an entire chapter entitled Mary, so that the Muslims read of the difficulties of Mary and they get inspired. Muslim woman had no inspiration. So Allah sends them a, verse, a chapter, Mary. Seek the example of Mary and be inspired. Allah gives them the example of Hud for the Muslims to be inspired. Allah gives them the example of Nuh for the Muslims to be inspired. Allah gives them the example of Ashab al-Kahf, the seven sleepers of the cave, for the Muslims to be inspired. This is the first portion. The second portion states, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرَى Why? The verse states, tell them, Ya Rasulullah, I ask you for no reward. I ask for no reward whatsoever. For this is a universal message. That's it. The verse is done. Why was this verse revealed, the second portion? The second portion was revealed because the Arabs accused Rasulullah, and this accusation remains until now, that Rasulullah was trying to start a business, to make money. So Allah tells him, Ya Rasulullah, it is forbidden for you to take money. As a reward for delivering the final message, tell them this is a universal message for everyone. So why are you coming and telling me we want to give you money? We're not going to accept money from anyone. This is in Surah Til. Surah what? Chapter 6 is what? Huh? An'am. Surah Til An'am, verse 90. Al-An'am is, is, al -an is sent down where? In Mecca. It's the longest chapter sent down in the holy city of Mecca. This verse was later on abrogated. How so? When Rasulullah went from Mecca to Medina. When he went to Medina, Aus and Khazraj were two tribes. They came to Rasulullah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, we the Aus and the Khazraj for 300 years were killing one another. Except in the sacred months, in the sacred months, they would drop the weapons. Amongst the months was what? Muharram al-Haram. They dropped the weapons. Other than that, they killed each other for 300 years. Over what? <coughs> Over a guy that was interested in, a guy from Khazraj interested in a girl in, in, in Aus, and he tried to marry her. They said to him, you tried to marry a girl from our tribe? We'll show you. 
300 years of killing each other. So they came to Rasulullah. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we lived such a horrible state. We were such inhumane individuals. This was our life. We would create gods out of dates and we would eat them. You came and you turned us into brothers. You created harmony amongst us. You delivered the message, Ya Rasulullah, how can we repay you? How can we thank you? Chapter 42, Surah Ashura, verse 23. 42, 23, a verse all of you have memorized, was sent down. قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا Tell them, Ya Rasulullah, I ask you for no reward, except, meaning there is one way for you to repay me. There is not two ways or three ways or ten ways to repay Rasulullah. Tell them there is no way to repay me except with the following. قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Except for the love, for the kinship. Except that love for my family. Now let me tell you how many years we've spent quoting this verse, hearing about this verse, memorizing this verse, yet we don't know the essence of this verse. How can you ever know the magnitude and appreciate the magnitude of this verse? if you don't know the fact that this verse happens to me amongst the Abrahamic principles. It happens to be an abrogated verse, and it happens to be a verse that dictates unto all of the Muslims that you must repay Rasulullah. It's not an option. You must be thankful towards Rasulullah, and the only way for you to do that is through the following. The love for the kinship. Al-Mawaddil Al-Qurba Many Muslims, they tell you we love Ahl Bayt We love Ahl Bayt The ayah doesn't ask for love The ayah asks for mawadda. For those who speak Arabic Or are familiar with Arabic There is a difference between Mahabba and Mawadda Mahabba is love, for you to love Mawadda is for you to show your love let me ask you a simple question, brothers. Today, in the mosques in Morocco, Tunisia, Mecca, Medina, Riyadh, is there a mention of Ahl al-Bayt? Is there a mention of Hussein ibn Ali? Is there a mention of his sacrifice? No. They claim that we love Ahl al-Bayt, but there is no mention. Furthermore, furthermore, I'd like to say this. Furthermore, they accuse the followers of Ahl al-Bayt with shirk because they're applying the Qur'an. Because I say this with full confidence that the followers of Ahl al-Bayt are the only ones, the Shia are the only ones applying this verse today. They are the ones that wear the black for Hussein. They are the ones that shed tears for Hussein. They are the ones that have a remembrance of Fatima, Ali, Hassan, and Hussein and the time of their remembrance. Yet, while they are applying the Qur'an, while they are following the requirements of the Qur'an, they are accused to be foreigners to Islam. Isn't it unfortunate? That today, every single Muslim must thank Rasulullah for delivering the message and the only way for us to show our gratitude to Allah, to Rasulullah, is through through the love for his kinship. Let me ask you. Today, many people around the world were upset about this movie. So they try to show their gratitude towards the Prophet, to show their love towards the Prophet. Allah tells you this is the way to show your love. Allah tells you this is the only way, not through building, burning buildings or burning flags or protesting. This is the only way. You want to tell Rasulullah you love him? Show your love for his Ahl al-Bayt. When it comes to this verse, this particular verse, there is one individual that needs to be examined, Truly. 
a forgotten character. Hind al Makhzumiyah al Qurashiyah. Hind al Makhzumiyah al Qurashiyah was married to the cousin of the Prophet. When they got married, after a couple of years, they migrated from Mecca to Abyssinia. In Abyssinia, they had a son by the name of Salama. Soon after Salama was born, the pagan Arabs, they came to Abu Salama and his wife, Um Salama, and they told them that, look, we've made Muhammad the governor. The Muslims now are no longer prosecuted, so come back to the Arabian Peninsula. So Abu Salama, Um Salama, and Salama returned to Mecca. They saw, no, the situation has gone worse. So Abu Salama decided he's going to take his family and they're going to migrate to Medina. While they were migrating to Medina, Um Salama's family came and took Um Salama and Salama and they told her husband, you took her once to Abyssinia, it was enough, go on your own. So Abu Salama, poor guy, he went by himself to Medina. Several years later, I'm making this long story very short. Several years later, Um Salama and Salama went to Medina. Her husband Abu Salama, Abdul A'la, fought in Badr and he was killed in Uhud. He was killed in Uhud. Therefore, when you go and visit the companions of Uhud, amongst the people that is buried in Uhud is whom? Abu Salama, Abdul A'la. After the martyrdom of Abu Salama, Salama came to Rasulullah, crying and mourning. Rasulullah said to him, Salama, I would like for you to marry Fatima, the daughter of Hamza. Hamza was also martyred in, and where? Inshallah, tonight you go and you rest well. Tomorrow before you come, you take the energy drinks. Because the lectures will keep getting tougher and tougher. So, Rasulullah told Abu Salama, told Salama, Salama, you will marry Fatima, the daughter of Hamza. So, Salama married the daughter of Hamza, Fatima. And he continued to tell Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, marry my mother. I want you to marry my mother. Now my mother has no one. At that time, while his mother was 35 years old, Rasulullah married Um Salama. Hence, the wife of Rasulullah, Um Salama, Um al Um Salama plays a vital role in transferring hadith of Rasulullah in regards to the love to the kinship. Meaning, in Muslim, when you refer to Sahih, Muslim, and you refer to Hadith al-Kisa narrated by Imam Muslim, it's narrated by Um Salama. When you refer to, for example, Al-Mustadrak ala Sahihain, when you refer to different historical events that have to do with Rasulullah and his family, and the love for the family, you find Um Salama is extremely vocal. Um Salama gave her bay'ah to Imam Ali, and after Imam Ali to Imam Hassan, and after Imam Hassan to Imam Hussein. And after Imam Hussein to Imam Ali ibn al Hussein. Hence, you never hear about Um Salama. You hear about other wives. But Um Salama, no. You never hear about her. When you go to Hajj, you always find them quoting from other wives. But you never find them quoting from Um Salama. One of the hadiths that she brings to us is the hadith of the departure of Hussein ibn Ali from Medina. She says, Hussein came to me. He said to me, Ummah, Um Salama, I'm here to say my goodbyes to you. It's going to be a long journey. She said, automatically, I said to him, Hussein, come and hug me. Hug me. She said, I embraced him. I smelt his scent. I cried. I said, Hussein, I'd like to remind you when you were a baby. 
When you were a baby, one day you walked into the presence of Rasulullah while Rasulullah was resting. And Rasulullah began to play with you. I went out and came back. I saw Rasulullah shedding tears. His entire beard is full with his tears. I said to him, Ya Rasulullah, what is it that makes you cry? He said, Um Salama, Jibra'il just descended onto me, bringing me from the clay of Karbala, the sand of Karbala, telling me that my grandson Hussein will be killed in that soil, on that soil. Um Salama, take this dust. When this dust turns into blood, know that Hussein has been murdered in Karbala. Imam Hussein told her, Huwa kama akhbaruk. أَخْبَرَكِ جَدِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Indeed, it is what my grandfather has told you. Um Salama, keep the dust. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Then Imam Hussein, if we can get the lights. Imam Hussein had a daughter by the name of Fatima. The first thing that Imam Hussein did was he told Um Salama, Um Salama, I want to keep my daughter Fatima, who is ill, with you in Medina. Imam Hussein said his goodbyes to his daughter Fatima al Alila. And as soon as he said his goodbyes to Fatima al Alila, he walked away. Suddenly he heard his daughter calling out, Ya Abata, Ya Aba Abdullah. O oh, Father Hussein, do not leave me. And she began to cry. Imam Hussein told her, O oh daughter Fatima, don't cry, you are with your grandmother, Um Salama. She said to him, O oh father, now that you are leaving me all by myself in Medina, at least leave my brother Ali al Azgar with me, Abdullah. Imam Hussein told her, Oh Fatima, Abdullah, your brother has a task in this journey. Allahu Akbar. Tonight to remind ourselves of the arrival of the camp of Hussein towards Karbala. But before we arrive to Karbala, let us depart towards Karbala. Let us all go with our souls, our body and our minds towards the city of Karbala. We stand in front of the shrine of Hussein. We say to him, Ya Sayyidana wa Maulana. All the lovers of Hussein, please tonight do not remain silent. Ya Sayyidana wa Maulana. Inna tawajjahna wa istashfa'na. وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا all together loudly يا وجيها عند الله ما شاء الله ما شاء الله Ya Hussein, take a glance at this majlis. Ya Wajihan. Ya Wajihan. The third time, Ya Wajihan. And Allah. Narration say Aba Abdullah sitting on his horse reached a desert. His horse would not move. Aba Abdullah changed his horse once, twice, three times. Some narration say Abu Abdullah embarked on a different horse for six consecutive times. Then he looked and he said, Masmuhad al-Ayar.
what is the name of this land? They said, Naynawa, Ya Aba Abdullah. He said, Hallaha ismun akharun qalu karbala. Is there another name for it? They said, Indeed, Ya Aba Abdullah. It is called Karbala. He raised his hands to Allah. Allahumma inni a'udhu bik min karbiha wa balaya. Abu Abdullah al Hussein camped in Karbala. He put the tents of Bani Hashim. He put the tents of Abu Al Fadl. He put his own tent, the tent of the woman, and the tent of Ansar, and the tent of a man that, inshallah, we'll speak of in the next upcoming night. He was coming later by the name of Habib ibn Mazahir. Then he took the hands of Ali ibn Al Akbar. He took the hands of his brother Abu Al Fadl. And he told them, come with me. He went all the way towards the Euphrates. He said to him, Akhah, ya Abel Fadl, this is the location where you will fall. He looked at his son, Ali al Akbar. He said, Ali, my son, this is the location where you will fall. Now, if you guys want to leave Hussein, then leave Hussein today. Because there is a death that is unescapable. They saw Abu Al Fadl al Abbas's hand shaking, crying. Abu Abdullah tells him, Ya Abu Al Fadl, why is it that you're shaking? You're a lion. Why is it that you're crying? He said, Ya Abu Abdullah, how can you tell ma? How can you tell your brother Abbas to neglect you in the deserts of Karbala? I want to say this and conclude. Imagine what went through to Um Salama when she suddenly saw on the tenth of Muharram that clay turn into a boiling blood. Um Salama every day kept crying until one day she was sitting, she heard a man raising his voice. يا أهل يذرب لا مقام لكم بها يا يا أهل يذرب لا مقام لكم بها what's going on قتل الحسين فأذم عيم درار Hussein has been murdered. Where? Al Jismu Manu bin Karbala. The body is in Karbala. Where is the head? Wal Ra'is Fawq al Ruh Yudar. Let us raise our hands to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those tears for Hussein are precious. Those tears for Aba Abdullah al Hussein, inshallah, will be a shield of protection in the day of judgment. Let us raise our hands ten times, brothers and sisters, with the loudest of your voices. I said this yesterday. I said, if Allah glances at this majlis, where every single one of us has have gone to Him desperately, where every single one of us has gone to Him with pure intentions where every single one of us know that He is the only one that can give us our hajat, then every single one of us will walk out of here with our hajat. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرِ Muftar is a person that is desperate. نَسْأَلُكَ اللَّهُمَّ وَنَدْعُوكَ بِاسْمِكَ الْعَظِيمِ الْأَعْظَمِ 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 الْأَعَزِّ الْأَجَلِّ الْأَكْرَامِ يَا اللَّهُ يَا اللَّهُ يَا اللَّهُ يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم اللهم إنا نسألك ونقسم عليك بمحمد وعلي 
وفاطمة والحسن والحسين والتسعة المعصومين من ذرية الحسين Oh Allah, forgive our sins Oh Allah, shower onto this gathering with your mercy and compassion O oh Allah, every mu'min, every mu'minah present in this majlis, give them their hajat. O oh Allah, every mu'min, every mu'minah present in this majlis with an illness, give them cure. O oh Allah, those facing difficulty in their life, O oh Allah, give them from your salvation. Our parents, our grandparents, our relatives, mu'mineen and mu'minat, those who have passed away from this majlis, shower onto their graves from your mercy and compassion. O oh Allah, give us the visitation of Hussein Qariban Ajila and the Shafa'ah of Hussein in the Day of Judgment. Hasten the reappearance of Mawlana Sahib Al Zaman wa ila arwah al Mu'mineen wa al Mu'minat. Al Fatiha ma'as Salawat.